Shout for joy to God, all the earth! Sing the glory of His name! Give to Him glorious praise! Say to God, how awesome are Your deeds! So great is Your power that even Your enemies come cringing before You. All the earth worships You and sings praises to You. They sing praises to Your name and Yours alone. And God, we want to say. These words of honor back to you. How awesome are your deeds, and how great is your power! And Father, we want to see more and more your church grow in this power, not for our sake, but for the sake of your name to be known and renowned, loved, feared, revered, and adored. So we do ask that you would release your spirit in power over this place and over your church in this nation and in this peninsula, that the power of the gospel would go forth in how we live, in how we speak, in what we declare, so that this nation would come to know the beauty of the name of Jesus and His saving grace. Father, we do continue to pray for the healing of this nation. Comfort those who are mourning still, families who have lost loved ones in our ministry and in this nation. We ask that you would allow the counseling work and ministry of the Holy Spirit to be strong through your church, so that they would come to know the tenderness, the kindness of your heart for us. God, we also ask that by your Spirit, your Spirit would consecrate this place to be set apart and holy, so that your voice through your Word alone would be clearly heard. That all distracting attempts would be bound and canceled in Jesus' name, and so that our hearts would be softened to receive your Word and to be changed by it. God, I. Give my life into your hands right now, and I pray for grace, mercy, anointing, and power, so that Holy Spirit, you would preach through me today, so that all that I do, all that I say, all that I think, and the motives of my heart would exalt and honor the name of Jesus. So at this time, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. Our rock, our redeemer, and it is in the matchless name of Jesus we pray. Amen. There is a presence and a power that is needed in our service to Jesus. You know, D. L. Moody was used greatly by God throughout his lifetime to bring the gospel to many people,、uh, and he was a minister within Chicago、uh, for many years. But a turning point came for him. Uh, during an, an encounter that he would have on a regular basis with two elderly ladies in his congregation who prayed for him on a daily basis, and、uh, as he ministered for years, these women all of a sudden got gripped、uh, for the need to pray for power and anointing upon his life. And so, after service one Sunday, they approached him. And said,、uh, Pastor Moody, we are praying for you.、Uh, to which he smiled and he said, Well, thank you,、uh, but make sure you also pray for our people because I'm actually doing pretty okay.、Uh, and so they said, No, we really felt led by God to pray for greater power and anointing upon your life and ministry. And he was a little bit confused because he said, "Well, I have a very successful ministry right now."、Uh, at the time, he was overseeing the largest church in Chicago. And、uh, she, con they continued to press in and said, "No, this is how we feel.、Uh, God leading us to pray for you because there's still a breakthrough that needs to happen within your life and ministry." And Moody, actually being a humble man,、uh, 
uh, he felt compelled and said, then why don't you not just pray for me, why don't you pray with me? And so they began praying each week together for this kind of breakthrough. Then one day during a trip to New York City, uh, during the time that these women were praying for him on a daily basis, he felt compelled uh, to pray. And so his host, his friend who was escorting him in the big city of New York, uh, he asked his friend, take me home because I really feel the need to pray. So they went home and he spent time alone in his guest room on his knees. And then he started having a deeper encounter with God and a deeper love for God, a deeper hunger for God's presence in a way that he never had before. And he realized as he was journaling and reflecting back that that moment was an answer to these months of prayer that these women and he were having. In fact, uh, this is what he said in his journal. He says, after weeks of asking the Lord for anointing and breakthrough, that day, I believe, is the day that it happened. He had an increase of love for Christ, his church, and the gospel. And then he says this, I cannot describe it. I can only say that God revealed himself to me, and I had such an experience of his love that I had to ask him to stay his heavy hand upon my life in this way. And I went, when I went back to preach again, he said the sermons were not different, and I did not present new truth. I still preached the gospel. And what I saw in his word. But yet now there was a difference in the response of the people. And now hundreds were converted when I would declare the same sermons now to a different audience. And so he said that there was a difference that, began, that he began noticing in terms of the flow in his ministry and the effectiveness in his ministry. So what these women were praying for, for their pastor, was anointing. You know when it's there, even though you cannot articulate it by a definition. There is a power, a presence, an effectiveness that anointing brings upon a person and a place and a ministry. And that's what we want to see growing within our own ministry, an anointed power and presence that is marked ultimately by a deeper love for Jesus, because that is the ultimate aim for all the works of the Spirit. And that's why we want to begin praying for more in our church, too. We're currently in a new series on how to pray for your pastor. And what we've been looking at in the earlier weeks was the importance to pray for your pastor, uh, especially in the realm of protection and also in the realm of rest. Uh, so many pastors around the world are burning out and are leaving the ministry at an alarming rate. And so we need to be aware that there's great warfare within the church, uh, and there's great warfare for the leaders of the church. And so we need to cover our pastors in prayer. And so we looked at praying for protection and praying for rest, and today we want to look at the importance of praying for anointing. So everyone repeat, pray for anointing. All right, that's what we want to look at today. So open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, and we want to explore how we can pray for anointing, and what does that mean, and how we can pray for that more effectively within our lives and our ministries. So follow along with me in your outlines as well. So what does it mean to pray for anointing for your pastor? There's a few elements that I want to uh, guide us through today. And first of all, it means praying for intimacy. So everyone repeat, pray for intimacy. You see, there is a connection between anointing and intimacy with the Lord. What do I mean? Let's unpack that now. First John chapter 2, starting from verse 20. It says, but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. And so these verses give us a foundational understanding of anointing within the new covenant. 
First of all, look at verse 20 again. What we learn in verse 20 is that anointing is connected with the presence of the Holy Spirit within our lives. Uh, It says, you have been anointed by the Holy One. So on one level, all of us who have faith in Christ and have received the Holy Spirit as a seal of our redemption, as proof of our salvation, because when you become a believer, God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. And so that presence of the Holy Spirit within all believers' lives on one level uh, is an anointing of God, of the Holy Spirit within our lives. So one way that we could look at this is that all believers have an anointing of, the whole, of God through the presence of the Holy Spirit within our lives. But also we realize that people, places, uh, there is a different kind of anointing uh, that we also see manifest in certain people or certain places. So there's another element of anointing that we also want to explore today. And these verses also teach us that this basic anointing is also connected to intimacy or true knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. So let's look at verse 20 again. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you do know the truth. And then he unpacks that truth ultimately as, do you know who Jesus Christ is? Jesus is the truth, right? He says of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is the truth. And the partnership that the Spirit has with the Son, Jesus, is that the Spirit's role is to guide people into all truth and ultimately to guide people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So it is the Spirit that guides people to Jesus. You see, one of the key roles of the Holy Spirit is to reveal truth and ultimately to reveal Jesus to people. So a sign that the Holy Spirit has been working in your life is when you come to know the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of all. Amen? So when you come to know this truth, that is a sign that the Spirit is at work within you. So the Spirit, His gifts in our lives, the fruit in our lives uh, that comes from Him, and even signs, wonders, miraculous workings of the Spirit through people's lives... They are all meant to point people to Jesus. That is the ultimate aim. Uh, Look at verse 21 and 22 again. So I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. And so he is saying, so this knowledge of truth and this knowledge of Jesus is not just intellectual knowledge. He is speaking of a personal, intimate relationship with him. You see, there is a difference between knowing about someone and truly knowing someone. So all of us, you know, we could say, hey, I know Barack Obama or I know George Bush. Uh, And so we're basically saying, I know who they are. We know about them. Uh, But if we were to ask Obama, hey, do you know these people? Or do you know Eddie Bion? He's like, Eddie who, right? I know Eddie Murphy. Don't know Eddie Bion, right? Why? Because true knowledge with Jesus is based on intimacy with Jesus. So that's the knowledge he's talking about here. It's not just head knowledge. It is a heart knowledge. And so even Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter 7 that we could do a lot of service for Jesus but never have a real intimate relationship with him. He says in Matthew 7, 21 and following, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many, many people on judgment day will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And cast out demons in your name. And do many mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Well, 
that's probably one of the scariest set of words that you could ever experience, ever. To Jesus, for Jesus to say to you, depart from me, I never knew you. Now, what he is saying is there's going to be a lot of people. He's saying, many people will say to me on Judgment Day. Many people know the right words to say to Jesus. They know that he is Lord in their head. They know to call him Savior in their head. And he even says they can do a lot of service in his name. Look, we cast out demons in your name. We perform miracles in your name. We drove out so many demons. We have prophesied. We did many mighty works in your name. So we could do a lot of stuff knowing his name, in his name, without truly knowing the person of Jesus Christ. That is a fearful and sobering reminder for all of us today. You see, even Richard Baxter, he was a Puritan preacher many years ago, in his book, Reformed Pastor. And this book is a book that really influenced my life growing up. And uh, I use it as a required textbook for a pastoral leadership class that I teach at Torch. And he speaks about, in this book, written for pastors, keep in mind, he speaks about the need for all believers, even pastors, to examine our hearts and our faith to make sure that we truly know the Christ that we preach. He begins the opening page of his opening chapter of this book with these words. Many preachers are now in hell who had said a hundred times to call his hearers to do their utmost to escape it. Meaning, even people who preach the gospel may not know the God of the gospel. So do you truly know him? Do you have a real, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you just know about him based on immersion? That you are immersed in a church setting since you were young. In your family, in your churches growing up, you heard all the right truths, and it is truth. And you heard all the right lingo and the language lifted up to God, but you do not know God personally. Do you truly know him? That is the most important question that your life must answer. Do you truly know Jesus Christ? So pray for anointing that is the result of true knowledge and intimacy through walking with Jesus. Tied in with this idea of anointing and intimacy is also seen when we look at one of the definitions of anointing. One definition of anointing means to smear with, to cover with, to the overflow. And that's why in the Old Testament, they would pour oil over the head of the leaders during the anointing ceremony so that they are smeared with, covered with, overflowing with the oil. And that's what we want to see happen to our pastors as well. We want such intimacy with God that results in being smeared with the Spirit on a regular basis. Pray that we would be filled with, overflow with, and smeared with the Spirit all the days of our lives. Amen? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. He's saying if you're going to be filled with something that controls your life, don't let it be alcohol. If you're going to be filling your life with something that begins to control your life, let it be the Spirit of God. So when Paul says here, be filled with the Spirit, it has the meaning of being constantly filled with. It means we need to continually and constantly be filled with the Spirit. So you see, if we have faith in Christ, we all have the Spirit within us. But this command by Paul also reveals something, that we need a continual encounter with the Spirit in the place of intimacy with the Lord. So pray for this kind of intimacy as we are filled with the Spirit, smeared with the Spirit, the mark of His presence will be heavily upon our lives. So pray that we would be a people of His presence so that all who encounter us will encounter God in us 
That is anointing, an anointing of his presence, an anointing that comes through intimacy with the Lord. You see, God is omnipresent, right? He is everywhere, yes. But there are times when you realize that you are in his holy presence and everything changes. You see, God is everywhere, and yet when Moses encountered a manifest presence of the Spirit through the burning bush, suddenly he realized he was on holy ground. Again, God's presence is everywhere, but there is an anointing of his presence that makes you aware of the sacredness of the presence of God. And there is an anointing upon a place and people who dwell in that presence that also manifests the awe of God that is the reality around us. There's fear, reverence, worship, and life change that happens in the presence of the Lord. So I want to live in his presence in such a way that I will always be in his anointed presence so that when I meet people, they will meet God. Because those who dwell in the presence of God leave changed. There is something about the anointed presence of God that changes everyone who encounters it. Amen? So that kind of intimacy results in humility and courage, clarity and focus, wisdom and insight, love and compassion. So pray for anointing through intimacy with the Lord. But that's not all anointing would mean when we pray for it. It also means praying for consecration. So everyone say consecration. All right, so look at what Jesus says at the start of his public ministry in Luke chapter 4. He is quoting Isaiah uh, as the prophet Isaiah prophesies of the coming Messiah. Luke 4.18 says, But the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, one of the things that you've, you need to keep in mind is that the concept of Messiah or Christ actually means the anointed one. And so Christ is the ultimate anointed one. And even Christ, he is proclaiming that the Spirit of God is upon him and has anointed him for service. So there is an anointing that is needed for public ministry. Why? Because our service to the Lord must not be done by our own power and strength. God's work cannot be accomplished in the flesh. It must be done with faith and in the power of the Spirit. Jesus was anointed to preach, proclaim, heal, and set captives free. And this reveals another aspect of anointing that we need to be aware of. That he was anointed for what? For his public service of ministry in God's kingdom. And so it is about being consecrated and set apart for service. Much of the Old Testament's mentioning of anointing was for its prophets, priests, and kings as they were set apart, consecrated for their respective leadership service to the people of God. And ultimately, all of these roles pointed us to the ultimate prophet, priest, and king, Jesus Christ. Now, why is it so important to pray for consecration and holiness for the pastors? Because as we mentioned in the earlier sermons of this series, pastors are more visible, uh, they have greater influence because of their public platform, therefore, there are greater consequences if we fall. And unfortunately, many pastors are falling by the hundreds, if not thousands. So we need to keep them in prayer. Therefore, pray that we would honor our call to be set apart for Christ and for the gospel we proclaim. Pray that this consecration would result in a greater love for holiness and a greater hatred of sin. Pray 
that we would hate compromise and instead live a life consecrated wholly unto him. Amen? And there's one more way to pray effectively for anointing. Uh, and that means praying for power. So everyone repeat, praying for power. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. It says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Now, once again, we see here in both the Old Testament and New Testament that anointing is connected with the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit releases a power through his presence. So it was through this anointing upon David and even Saul that after they were anointed, their life and their ministry was never the same again. Because one of the most distinguishable things about anointing is that it comes with power. It's hard to define, but easy to notice when anointing is upon a place, a ministry, and a life. For example, there are people who are gifted in music, and there are people who are anointed in music. There's a difference. A harpist who, is, who plays for the Philharmonic Orchestra is clearly gifted if that person was selected to be the harpist for that orchestra. You have to be gifted to get that position. But David, when playing his harp, he was anointed, so much so that demons would flee the presence of Saul when David would play. There's a difference between gifting and anointing. And I'd much rather have anointing. You know, one of, my, uh, one of the praise leaders that I worked with uh, many years ago, he was a growing musician. Uh, he was decent at guitar. He was decent at singing. So everything was okay. And ever since he started, because he was new to praise leading, he would often come up for prayer. And the praise team and I, we were committed to praying for him to grow in this gifting and this role that God wanted to use him for. Uh, and so, you know, there were times where he would play and uh, that would cause us to pray uh, because we're like, he needs our prayers. Um, but I remember one day when I walked into the, the room where we would have worship service, you know, I'd get there early and the praise team's always practicing. I distinctly remember the exact day that I walked in and they were playing and suddenly I sensed the presence of God in a different way in that place. And I was like, is, do we have a guest praise leader today? Is there like a different praise team coming in today? Uh, and I remember asking my wife that, hey, is, is somebody else leading praise today? Um, but it was the same guy, uh, but literally from that day, something changed. Uh, when he started playing and singing, suddenly we became more aware of the presence of God. Our prayers for anointing were answered that day. Um, like I said, it's hard to define what anointing is, but it is easy to pick out. There was an anointing and a power of the Spirit that made people aware of His presence from that day. Uh, you know, I experienced this in a lot of different capacities when I was growing up. Even when I was in junior high, high school, and college, uh, there was a praise ministry in Chicago that would travel across the country during my youth group days. And this band was not musically gifted at all. And if you were to actually listen to some of the tapes that they would record the sessions in, you would be like, why in the world is anyone inviting these people to lead praise? Uh, they were not gifted in music, but they prayed. And they prayed a lot. Um, and I think maybe it's out of God's mercy for them <laughs> to compensate or something. But you see, different people would start asking them to lead praise for retreats, for conferences, for praise, uh, praise nights, all these things like that. And this praise uh, team, they were a people who committed first and foremost to prayer. And if they, for example, if it was January and they got invited to lead praise for a retreat in July, and I can testify that they do this, they would pray every day 
uh, the moment they accepted an invitation until the event, every day uh, for this event. And so when they would go there to lead praise, God's spirit would show up in a powerful way where people would give their lives to Christ or give their lives to ministry on a regular basis at these gatherings. And it was fascinating for me because as I started experiencing it as a junior high kid and then a high school kid, and then I got a chance to actually see the ins and outs of this ministry when I was in college, uh, it's, that, it's then that I realized that it's not about ability that's most important in ministry. It is about anointing. And it is about a gracious act of God that releases his power. You see, there's a connection between intimacy, and that's why we pray for that for anointing. There's a connection between intimacy and consecration before the Lord and anointing. Those three prayer requests that I just outlined for you, it's intentional and it's progressive that it begins with intimacy with the Lord, our time spent in the presence of prayer, ministering before the Lord, understanding that the presence of God in prayer becomes our home, our regular place of dwelling, that it is in that prayer place that we encounter God in prayer that the presence of God begins to manifest and dwell upon a person or a place of prayer. Then as you pray for intimacy, then you pray for consecration. Why? Because you don't just dwell with God in prayer. You understand that your role as a minister needs to be set apart and holy unto the Lord. As you dwell in the presence of God, his presence begins to dwell there. And then you know that you are set apart, consecrated, and then you begin to honor God and hate sin, fear sin, because you revere the Lord. And then you begin to experience the power of God upon that place and upon that ministry. So these three prayer requests, they're vital for understanding growth of anointing upon a person or a place or a ministry. You see, what was happening is that as this praise ministry that was not gifted with music began dwelling in the presence of God daily for this event and this church, it would accumulate so much prayer by a people who dwelt in his presence by so long that the moment that they went there to minister, because they were living in the presence of God for months, if not years already, what they were doing is simply inviting the people into their regular dwelling, and that is the presence of God. And that's when these people started encountering God because the leadership lived in the presence of God. That's when I learned that it's not about ability, it is about the Spirit's anointing that is more important to have in a life and a ministry. More than talents, It's the Spirit's power that brings life transformation in people and through people. Again, you need to understand why it is so hard to define, yet easy to experience. And you know when it is there. Because again, God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. But there is a difference when you encounter the reality of the presence of God in a place and through a people. Because when He anoints a place, when he anoints a person, things change. You know, I had good friends in Wheaton College uh, because I graduated college in 1995, so that will date me, but that's okay. Um, Because my friends uh, who graduated from Wheaton the same year that we graduated um, our college years, if you never heard of it before, During 1995, Wheaton College went through a mini revival. And you could actually do a Google search on this. Wheaton College revival in 1995. Between the dates of March 19th to March 23rd, the Spirit of God started showing up at Wheaton College in a very unique way. Uh, Certain students got convicted uh, to repent of certain sins. And they gathered together to pray in their chapel. But then more and more people started to gather together to pray, to repent, to confess sins. And they would actually uh, publicly repent of sins and confess sins and throw away uh, things, 
materials, music, magazines that they felt were sinful uh, against their hearts and their lives. And then more and more people started doing this to the point where for those several days between March 19th and March 23rd, uh, it was a constant state of praise, prayer, worship, repentance, confession for those days. And I had good friends that were part of that. And they told me how, uh, you know, people went to that chapel, same place, to pray before. People went to pray before. People went to confess before. People went to repent before. Same place, same stuff, but suddenly there was an anointing. There's something about what God was doing in that place to do what? To consecrate people. Set apart people for himself. And when there is an anointing there, things begin to change. But before we get too, you start thinking that it's too much of a mystical thing, I need to clarify something here. So we mentioned earlier, the power the Spirit gives through anointing has a specific purpose. And that purpose is to point people to Jesus as we declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts 1.8, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll do what? You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So God empowers us with the Spirit, anoints us so that we will be bold witnesses of Jesus to the ends of the earth. The power the Spirit has given, us, has given to us was so that people would come to know the name of Jesus through the declaration of the gospel. You see, power is given so that the gospel can advance. That's the purpose of it. This is the purpose of signs and wonders as well. So regardless of your theological stance of this, my stance is that I will never, I could never tell God that you can't, he can't do something anymore. So that's, that's where I stand, okay? So again, you may have different convictions. That's, what, that's just where I am. Um, I believe God can do whatever he wants. He's God, okay? Um, and signs and wonders, but we need to understand the ultimate purpose of them as well. Signs are just that. They are a sign, a sign post to point people to Jesus. Wonders are given so that people would be in wonder and worship Jesus. Not the messenger, not the gifts, but the giver of all gifts and grace, Jesus. You see, the true mark of a spirit-filled believer is not speaking in tongues, but using our tongues to praise and honor the name of Jesus and point people to him. You see, the greatest power that comes with the Spirit's presence and anointing in a purpose, person's life is not the power to move mountains, nor is it the greatest power to raise a person from the dead. Because there is something greater than raising a physical body from the dead, and that is raising a soul from the dead unto salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is greater because there is eternal significance when a soul is raised unto new, new, newness of life in Christ. Amen? That is a far greater miraculous significance to declare through mere words the gospel of Jesus Christ for a life to understand it, to surrender to it, and to be created unto newness of life eternally. That is a greater miracle than even raising the dead. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. That is the power that we must pray for within our ministries and our ministers. That they would boldly declare the gospel of Jesus Christ without fear, with complete faith to exalt the name of Jesus. So pray for anointing and the power of the Spirit and the power of the gospel to be the mark of their ministry in their lives. I truly believe pastors would be more effective, more anointed, and the gospel would reach more people if more people prayed for their pastors. Amen? So pray for more anointing in our lives, for more of his presence to be manifest within our lives, for more of his power to flow through our lives, and for more intimacy with Jesus, 
so that we'll fall deeper in love with Jesus, that we would be smeared with his presence, and then out of the overflow of that presence, go forth and live in this world so that all who encounter us would encounter God in us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your many gifts you give to us and to our lives, the gift of the Spirit, the gift of your presence, the gift of grace. And Lord, we want to continue to grow to be a people of your presence. Lord, we ask for your grace, your gracious gift, to be a people marked and smeared by your presence so that whenever we meet anyone, they will meet the God who lives within us. God, I ask that you would allow that anointed presence to rest upon OEM and to rest upon the people and the pastors of OEM. God, we want to dwell in your presence and we want to bring that presence wherever we go. And we want people to encounter that presence wherever we go. So we pray for that gracious gift to more and more be the mark of this church. And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think or imagine, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all nations and throughout all generations. Be exalted forever and ever. Amen.